Okay. Welcome back up to break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we uh, looked at the the last part of uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter that he wrote to him. Uh, so we looked at chapter six, the last few verses. We studied that. Uh, before we move on to Paul's second letter to Timothy, uh, does anyone has uh, does anyone of you have any questions um, regarding? Uh, his first letter, First Timothy. Anything that you'd like to discuss about uh, what we studied in chapter six? Any thoughts? Any questions? Anything that you need more clarity on? Anything? Okay, there is silence, so I'll take it as no questions. We'll move on to Second um, Timothy chapter 1. Okay, thank you, Asha. Thank you, Kung. Uh, we'll move on to Second Timothy chapter 1. Okay, uh, so before we look at chapter 1, you know, this is Second um, Timothy. Uh, you know, when Paul is writing his letter, he's almost done 24 years of his ministry. He's traveled to 15 major cities. Uh, and um, in his 24 years of ministry, for 18 years, Timothy was alongside uh, with Paul, uh, learning from him, uh, drawing uh, principles for ministry, for life. Uh, just looking at the life and the work of um, Paul, Timothy has learned so much. And, um, you know, from growing to be uh, from a, a son in the faith, uh, you know, being mentored by Timothy, now he comes to a place uh, where Paul feels that he has, he's spiritually mature, spiritually strong uh, to oversee uh, uh, or to give spiritual leadership to the churches at Ephesus, which is an important strategic uh, city, uh, overseeing also seven churches around uh, the, uh, uh, the, the city of Ephesus. So it was a huge responsibility, and uh, Paul knew that uh, Timothy was the best person uh, for this uh, important role, this important position. And so he leaves um, uh, Timothy at Ephesus, and then you know, we know that he uh, goes on uh, uh, to Macedonia and he writes uh, First Timothy there, and then Paul goes uh, or returns to Rome, uh, where he's imprisoned for the second time, and this is somewhere around AD 67 to AD 68. Um, and this time Paul knew that that was imminent, that he is surely going to uh, die, and uh, before he his death. You know, he writes his last episode uh, to Timothy, which is Second Timothy. So Second Timothy is his final words of instruction uh, to his son in the faith, who's now grown to be his co-worker, co-laborer in Christ Jesus, along with uh, uh, Paul. And uh, in this letter, we see that, you know, he requests Timothy to come to him soon. Uh, but shortly after he writes this letter, and this letter is, you know, been dispatched or sent over to Timothy, uh, Paul uh, is martyred um, about AD 68, soon after he writes this episode. And traditions say that uh, he was beheaded um, because uh, he was a Roman uh, citizen. And because he was a Roman citizen, it's unlikely that he would have been put to death in any other uh, manner. OK, so that is briefly. Um, a little background for uh, uh, Paul's uh, second letter uh, to uh, Timothy. You know, uh, in the first letter, he, you know, we just studied it. Uh, he basically instructs Timothy on how to lead uh, uh, the the local church, the community of uh, saints or believers at Ephesus. But uh, his letter to uh, second letter to Timothy is a more personal letter where Paul is basically sharing uh, specific instructions uh, to Timothy on how to live uh, a life as a minister of uh, God, 
Okay, so there's something that we can also learn, like we learned the first letter, how we can draw principles and uh, how to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, lead or uh, do things in the local community, the local church, among the believers. Uh, but in this letter, we can also learn uh, more about how we can live a life as a minister of God and fulfill the calling that God has for uh, us and how God requires us to live. Okay, so we look at um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll not read the entire uh, chapter, but we just read it verse by verse. So can uh, somebody uh, read verses 1 and 2, please? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Second Timothy. Second Timothy ahead, chapter Elijah. one, verses one and two. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, <clears throat> by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Elisha. So here Paul acknowledges that, uh, you know, he is an apostle uh, of Jesus Christ. And it is not that he is an apostle, apostle by his own will, his own choosing, or because he is just uh, designated himself or assigned himself as an apostle. But he says, by the will of uh, God. Okay, it is, we know from scripture, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, there we see that the ministry offices are something that is appointed uh, by Jesus Christ himself. So the, the ministry office of an apostle, uh, you know, of a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher is appointed uh, to uh, different people uh, by Jesus himself, you know, so that is um, the ministry offices that is given to us by Jesus or by God himself. It's God who determines who's an apostle, a pastor, a, um, a, a teacher, um, and an evangelist. Okay, So he says that he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And he says, according to the promise of life. Now, this is uh, a, a statement that he makes here is very unique compared to the other greetings uh, in all of other Paul's uh, epistles or letters. Uh, and it's very appropriate that he writes this here because, you know, Paul uh, at this stage is imprisoned. He's not in home imprisonment where he's free. Uh, he's, you know, in proper imprisonment and he knows that that is impending upon him. He's going to die soon. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, which he mentions also later in this episode. But uh, he locks into this truth that, you know, even though death is impending upon us, you know, we're going to die any moment, anytime we can be killed, martyred, uh, you know, we can face death. But he, you know, he locks into this truth that we have the promise uh, life. We have we have been promised life. And he's talking here, the Greek word for this promise of life here is um, eternal life. The Greek word there is zoe, which is talking about eternal life, the God kind of life, or the fullness of uh, the life that God has in himself. And he's saying that, you know, this promise of life, which is in Jesus Christ. So this life, this zoe life that is in God himself, you know, we have been promised this life, this eternal life. So he's, you know, uh, just imagine, you know, Paul writing this, um, even as he's going to face death, you know, um, but he has this wonderful assurance. So Paul is not just uh, overwhelmed with what is happening, the challenges, the difficulties uh, that is surrounding him at the moment, uh, but he's always living for, or he's always living with this perspective of eternity, of uh, what, uh, you know, eternity holds for him, has for him, and, you know, what he can fulfill about eternity here in the uh, present. And then he goes on to say, you know, to Timothy, a beloved son, again, talking about his closeness, his love for Timothy, uh, his uh, his uh, uh, his association with him, uh, what position or uh, who Timothy is, what he means uh, to him. He says he is his beloved son, and then he says grace, mercy, and 
peace. Now, if you look at uh, all of Paul's uh, uh, greetings in all of his other letters, which he writes to various churches, like the church at Rome, Corinth, uh, Galatia, church at Galatia, uh, Ephesus, uh, 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 in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, or church at Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, all of these he just basically writes, um, you know, he uses grace and peace. Uh, but when he's writing to specifically to pastors, like spiritual overseers, elders, uh, Timothy and Titus, uh, he's compelled to greet them with grace, mercy and peace. Not just grace and peace, like he includes in his greetings to all the other churches that he writes in his different epistles. But here in his epistles to or letters to Timothy and to uh, Titus, he, he, he also adds uh, mercy because he knows that, you know, uh, as pastors in this important strategic place, as spiritual leaders, we just don't need the grace and mercy, the peace of God, but we also need the mercy of God um, to help us to stay there, uh, to fulfill the calling, to do what God has entrusted to us and to hold fast to our uh, faith. So he says grace and he adds mercy and then also uh, peace. Okay. And uh, he says grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ. But so he's just basically saying that this grace, mercy, and peace is does not come from our situations, our life, uh, but it comes from God. Uh, it's he's a, God is the source, the giver. He's the one who blesses us with grace, mercy, and peace. And this grace, mercy, and peace that he gives us is unlimited. Okay, and this grace, mercy, and peace does not come from human beings. It only comes from God. It is unlimited. Um, so when we pray, uh, you know, for ourselves, uh, we can also pray uh, for God's grace, mercy, and peace in our life. And when we pray for someone else, we can also pray the same thing. Uh, you know, we can pray uh, God's grace, mercy, and peace over their lives as well. Uh, because, you know, His grace, His mercy, and peace is unlimited and abounding in supply. We'll move on to verse uh, 3. So can somebody read verse 3, please? The verse 3 says, I thank God who I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers, in my prayers night and day. Amen. Thank you, Harrison. So here, uh, see, uh, again, he's talking about a pure conscience. He's talking about serving God with a pure conscience in his uh, earlier epistle to Timothy uh, in first Timothy uh, Paul again talks there about pure and a good conscience and he mentions this pure and good conscience at least three times and now he states the same thing here in relation to how uh, you know uh, he has been serving God and this is uh, something that we can learn you know that even as we desire to serve God even as all of us are called to serve God, even as all of us are called as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, you know, we need to serve God with a clear, good, and a pure conscience. It's only when we have a clear conscience, uh, you know, we, uh, it's, it, we have a clear, good, and pure conscience only when we live right before God and uh, man. So, you know, people uh, cannot see our inner motives, our inner thoughts, our inner agendas, our schemes, and all the things that we do, uh, but we know it, and God holds us accountable for our, uh, our motives, our thoughts, uh, you know, why we do what we are doing, and we need to maintain a pure, clean, and a good conscience before God all the time. Uh, and how do we have a clear conscience is uh, when we live right before God and man. And so, you know, he's not just saying that you need to serve God with a pure conscience, but he's also pointing out to the forefathers, which is he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, who walked righteously before God and man. And, you know, he uh, they walked righteously before God and a man uh, according to what uh, they received 
or the revelations that has uh, was manifested or made known or the truths that had been known to them in their time in their time in their age and their season uh, but you know uh, and they did what was right uh, before God uh, according to the revelation that they had during the time that they lived in. Now, in the age that we live in, you know, we have uh, greater revelations, greater manifestations, uh, which guides us how to live right in the sight of God. And we also have His Word uh, with us, which helps us to know how to live right uh, in the sight of uh, God. Okay. And then because of Paul's uh, great affection to Timothy, uh, it was so great that he says that he continues to pray for Timothy, uh, you know, night and day, just without ceasing. He continues to remember in his uh, prayer all the more now because uh, he has put Timothy in the strategic uh, position in this place. He knows the difficulties and hardships. And so all the more he is, uh, you know, praying for uh, Timothy without uh, ceasing. It also, um, you know, reminds us that we need to pray for men and women of God um, uh, who are, especially, you know, those who uh, are elders in the church, those who are giving spiritual leadership, those who are uh, teaching the word and doctrine. We need to pray for them, missionaries, evangelists, all those who are going through persecutions and for the saints uh, in the body of Christ. It's so important for us to pray for them, uphold them continuously uh, without ceasing, uh, pray for each one of them. Any questions on verses one, two, and three? Any thoughts, any questions? Okay. There are no questions, then we'll move on to verses 4 and 5. So can somebody please read verses 4 and 5, please? Can I read verses? Yes, please, Asha, thank you. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Louise, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I'm sure, dwells in you as well. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So, um, we see that, you know, Paul uh, is has a great desire to see Timothy, just to be with him, uh, just to impart to him. Uh, bless him uh, and he also says that you know he's mindful of his tears uh, perhaps you know um, uh, the tears that Paul remembered were the tears that Timothy shed in the last parting uh, when he left him at Ephesus and moved on uh, maybe you know Timothy cried or whatever so he remembers his tears and uh, he says you know uh, he talks about genuine faith here and he says that genuine faith is passed on as a heritage throughout the uh, gen generations or this uh, this uh, genuine faith is passed on as a heritage through the generations and this is what god uh, desires he wants the faith that uh, that is there if, uh, in one generation to be passed on to the succeeding uh, generations. We read this also in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. Uh, God desires uh, to see the spiritual truths, the anointing that is in one generation be passed on to the next generation and uh, to the next generation. Now, this does not happen automatically, you know, uh, but we uh, in this present generation, we need to work towards ensuring that, you know, uh, the, uh, the truths uh, the anointing uh, that is that we have received uh, in this generation is passed on uh, to the next generation, which means we need to be careful to model, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we the truth, what we the gospel, what we are living by, the word of God. We need to model it before our children and grandchildren. Uh, and this is the genuine faith that will be passed on to generations. We also need to impart these truths, teach these truths, these doctrines to the next generation and also pass on the anointing uh, 
and teach them to flow in the gifts of the spirit, pass on the anointing, uh, impart things into their lives so that you know it. Uh, uh, all of this is passed on from one generation uh, to the other uh, generation. So it's important that you know uh, we not only teach it but also live these things live these truths live uh, uh model this uh truth uh, uh model what uh, the word of god says in our lives uh, because you know uh, in the classroom uh things are taught but at home more things are taught than taught okay uh, so as uh, even in the church you know children are watching us observing us uh, they catch more of what we do, how we live, how we walk, how we speak, how we react, uh, they catch more than what they are taught. So, even at home, you know, children catch more what they are, uh, uh, what they see than what they are taught. So, it's important that we not only teach them, impart to them, but also model it out in the way that we. Um, uh, live. And then he talks about this genuine faith that uh, he sees in Timothy uh, and also the genuine faith is not something that is uh, a made up faith, a false pretense, something that you know you just try to act holy or pretend to be holy or act it out but he says your faith is very genuine uh, Timothy and uh, you know uh, he says you know this genuine faith seen in your grandmother Lois and also in your mother Eunice and now it's passed on to you so it's passed on from generations and so he's reminding Timothy of this great uh, you know uh, privilege that he has uh, of his position his calling and the great responsibility that he has to pass on uh, these truths uh, and also to live out this truth uh, you know uh, so that he's a he's a good testimony a good witness and also to teach to pass on and to impart these truths to uh, others Elisha says so the litmus test of how genuine a person's faith is is the ability to pass it on to generations yes the ability um, to pass it on and you can only pass it on when you are able to uh, yourself uh, uh, live it out and also to uh, you know practice it or to to do what it says so you can't uh, pass on something that you are not living or uh, uh, that you're not following that you are not doing yourself uh, to others you can only pass on the, the knowledge that you know that you have put into practice you can only pass it on to others so yes it's not just teaching but also living it out, also modeling it out to uh, the younger generation and also to teach it to uh, them and impart it into their um, lives. Okay, verses 6 and 7, can uh, one of you please read verses 6 and 7, please? Verses 6 and 7. Therefore. Yeah, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Thank you, Abinas. So he says, therefore, he's reminding Timothy to stir up the gift of um, uh, God. Okay, so Timothy was a gifted, a valuable man for the kingdom of God. Uh, but you know, uh, Paul sees in him, uh, uh, you know, a, a timid streak of uh, uh, a, a streak of being timid, of uh, being fearful, and so for this reason, you know, Paul uh, is often encouraging him uh, to be strong and to be um, bold. So it it seems to appear that Timothy might have been reluctant uh, to exercise his spiritual gifts. Uh, perhaps he's intimidated by people who are older than him, the elders, the spiritual leaders, the deacons, the bishops in that place who are much older. You know, sometimes he feels that he's uh, he shouldn't be speaking up, he shouldn't be telling them what to do. Um, but we see that, you know, um, Paul is telling him to be bold. And here in First Timothy and in Second Timothy, you know, uh, there are 25 
play, different places where Paul is basically encouraging Timothy uh, to be bold, uh, not to shy away from his confrontation of those who are opposing him, those who are doing things that are wrong, those who are not uh, living, uh, elders who are not living um, a holy life, those who are living a sinful life, those who are talking and teaching wrong doctrines and preaching wrong doctrines, you know, not to shy away from confronting them, uh, to stand up where he needs to stand up and to be strong. Uh, and he says that, you know, you need to do this because uh, of who, uh, you know, he is because of who Timothy was and the responsibilities he has to bear. And, uh, uh, you know, and he makes sure that Timothy hears this and knows this uh, because he needs to be encouraged to be bold and to be um, uh, strong. Okay. And he goes on to talk about, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. Okay, so he's saying that, you know, uh, you have not been given a spirit of, uh, uh, of fear, but you have been given a spirit that is of power, that is of love and a sound uh, mind. And then he goes on to, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, encourage Timothy, uh, like he says in First Timothy chapter uh, 4 verse 12, he encourages Timothy there, you know, Timothy, don't let uh, 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 you being a youth hold you back, uh, you know, from doing what you're supposed to do as a leader, but he exhorts him to exercise his gift. We, we looked at this in First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. Again, in First Timothy chapter 4 verse 14, he tells him not to neglect the gift that is in him, which was given to him by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Remember, we studied all of this. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 tells him, you know, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, because you're a youth. And then in verse 14 of chapter 4 of First Timothy, he says, don't neglect the gift that is in you, which is given to you by prophecy of laying on of hands of the uh, eldership. And so here again, in this second letter, second epistle, he encourages Timothy to stir up the gift of God in him. Uh, the, the word stir up basically means to kindle, uh, to a flame, to fire up. Now, if a fire is, uh, you know, you set something on fire and, you know, the wood is kind of uh, uh, ebbing, the fire is ebbing away, it's not burning fully, you know, you just uh, uh, stir it up, you just blow air into it and then you, you know, rekindle the fire. So he says, kindle the flame, you know, fire up a life, um, you know, stir up the fire that is in you, keep it burning, keep it burning bright and uh, strong. And so he's encouraging him to stir up the, you know, uh, the gift of God that God has given to him. So how do we stir up God's gift in us? Uh, basically, you know, spending time reading God's word, uh, praying, uh, spending more time in worship and prayer, you know, reading God's word. Also, you know, associating with people uh, who are flowing in the similar gifts and uh, using the gifts, uh, uh, you know, uh, more frequently, uh, stepping out in faith, just exercising the gifts. Uh, and the more you use the gifts, you know, uh, I'm talking the gifts of the spirit, the more, the stronger it will become in your life and the more confident you'll be, you'll be in operating and, uh, uh, you know, it will just activate the seeds of faith in your life to, uh, to use the gifts more often uh, to bless others. And he says, you know, you have, uh, do, do not neglect the gift that is in you. Uh, which you have received by prophecy. It's basically, and the laying on, on of hands of the eldership, it's basically talking about, uh, you know, how uh, when uh, when uh, the elders laid hands on Timothy, set him aside for the work of the gospel, for the ministry, uh, for his calling, you know, people prophesied over him, spoke over him, even as they laid hands, uh, the the spiritual gifts which is imparted into uh, his life so you know um, we can also receive spiritual gifts through uh, impartation uh, or spiritual gifts can be imparted into our lives uh, to uh, uh, and also can be activated in our lives uh, which means activated means can be initiated can get it started in our lives 
uh, when another believer just speaks into our lives, can lay hands on us, uh, just impart into our lives. So spiritual gifts can be imparted and activated by one believer into another uh, believer. And so also here when the elders laid hands on Timothy, you know, uh, he... Uh, he received an impartation of the spiritual gifts and also an activation of the spiritual gifts in his life. And so he's reminding him of what he has received, the spiritual gifts, and he's saying, you put this to good use, use it, you know, to bless the other saints, the believers in uh, Christ Jesus. And he says a reason uh, we need to stir up or, you know, set up these gifts God has given us um, uh, is because the Holy Spirit whom God has given us, you know, he fills us with power. Now this word power, the Greek word is dunamis, from which we get the word, English word dynamite. Uh, and so we know what a dynamite does, right? You put a dynamite, it can destroy an entire village, a city, uh, a locality, a neighborhood, uh, buildings. It's so powerful. Uh, so, you know, he's saying that uh, you need to stir up uh, and set out and, you know, use these gifts because the Holy Spirit uh, whom uh, God has given us, you know, he fills us with this power, which is not just, you know, ordinary power, simple power, but it's it's a dynamite-like power which can, you know, it, which can... Um, just move in such a powerful way that can bring deliverance, healing, wholeness, uh, restore people's life. It can just, you know, do that to an entire city, a nation, uh, you know, uh, entire church uh, uh, or people gathered there. Uh, it is that dunamis power that is in us. And then he's talking about, you know, because the Holy Spirit not only fills us with dunamis like power, but also love. And he's talking about love here. The Greek word is agape, God's love. You know, uh, uh, not any other kind of love that is uh, is based on situations. You know, you love me, I love you, you're good to me, you're nice to me, I'm good to you, I'm nice to you. But it's talking about God's love, uh, agape love, that even though we don't deserve God's love, his grace, his goodness, his mercy, yet he loved us as uh, sinners and he chose us. And so it's talking about that kind of love. And then a sound mind, a sound mind, which is talking about a mind that is self-controlled, self-disciplined, and self uh, and has self-governing um, ability. So God has given us um, dunamis-like power, a love that is agape love, God kind of love that will help us to love people irrespective of what they do to us, how they react to us, how they treat us, um, how they see us, and also a sound mind. Now, the ancient Greek word for the sound mind uh, has an idea of a calm, self-controlled mind, um, in contrast to a mind that is panicked, that is confused, uh, uh, that is living in constant fear, okay? So this, this verse is so powerful. It reminds us of uh, what, you know, we have received and other spiritual inheritance that we have received is we have not received a spirit of uh, a fear or spirit of timidity. So some of us who are filled with fear uh, are timid. We don't want to speak. We don't feel we are competent enough. We are good enough. You know, um, this is not what God has given to us. Uh, but what he has given to us, uh, he, uh, Paul mentions three things, power, love, and a sound uh, mind. And so he says, you know, stir this up in you. You know, every time you're filled with fear, just be reminded that you, God has filled you with power, uh, not a timid spirit, not a fearful spirit, um, but a power that is like a dynamite-like power. Use that, step out in faith, use it, love and self-control. And all of these three things uh, which the Holy Spirit gives to us, God has given to us, power, love and self-control is in the context of using the gifts of God. Okay, so when we use the gifts of God, it's not, we need to be reminded that when something happens to people, we see a good result uh, for what we have prayed for. It's not our power, but it's God's power. And you also, you know, exercise these gifts in the context of love, uh, because when Paul writes uh, uh, the 
uh, the uh, the gifts of the spirit in in first corinthians chapter 12 he goes on to talk about but you know greater than all of this is uh, chapter 13 he talks about love okay which is more important um, so you know love when there is, is there's love the, the gifts of the spirit will automatically be activated will be manifested but if there is no love you know we judge the person we think this person does not deserve uh, to be healed uh, so sinful or uh, you know uh, the the, uh, the prophecy that we give is um, is not something that enriches them, exhausts them, encourages them, builds them up, but it's something that puts them down because we know their life. We're not doing it in, in, in a context of love, then, you know, the gifts of the Spirit will not be activated in us or we will not be able to manifest the gifts of the Spirit. So it's important that you know, when in a, in a church context, when we are in a in a in a, in a in a context where believers are gathered, or in when you're having your life group or your Bible study group, if there's no love, there's no unity and oneness, then the gifts of the Spirit will not be manifested in the fullest sense. We will not see things happening in the full sense uh, of what uh, you know the manifestation of the of the gifts of the uh, Spirit, and also. You know, we need to, when we manifest the gifts of the spirit, we need to do it in a self-controlled way. And that is why Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He says, you know, hey, all of you are so eager. You have a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, word of prophecy. You know, you want to interpret tongues and all of that. It's great because you all are so mightily flowing in the gifts. But when you come to church, there should be some kind of order. We do that in a self we uh, we exercise the gifts in a self-controlled manner, in a self-controlled way. So wait for each other, listen to each other, don't be in a rush to speak, um, and uh, all of that, you know, maintain some kind of order and discipline in the uh, church. So even when we practice this uh, gifts of the Spirit, do it in love, do it in the power of God, and in a self-controlled uh, manner. And fear must not hold us in any way. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of failing. Don't be afraid of being wrong. Uh, you know, just step out in faith and you know, uh, do what God is asking you to uh, do. So we don't accept uh, what God has not given us. He has not given us a spirit of timidity or of fear. But what we need to do is we need to humbly receive and walk uh, humbly receive and walk in what he has given us. Uh, what has he given us? He's given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. And then verse 8, um, uh, he says, can somebody read verse 8, please? So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Uh, should I continue, Pastor? Uh, it's that's verse eight, right? Power of yeah. God. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, amen. Thank you, Divya. So here he says, therefore, so Paul has just told Timothy about the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind with courage. Uh, that is the birthright of every believer in Christ Jesus. This is our spiritual inheritance that you have received. So receive it today. Walk by faith that you have received a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And activate that. Use that. Stir that up. And use it with courage and boldness. Because that is your birthright as a believer in Christ Jesus. And he says, you know, even as he's mentioned this, he says, therefore, now he's telling Timothy how to let what God has given him to guide his thinking. So you've received all of these things. It's great. Now he's telling him, you know, what God has given him, how to guide him uh, uh, in his thinking. So he says, in the view of the spirit that God has given us, do not be ashamed of speaking about the uh, Lord. And also do not be ashamed with identifying with genuine ministers of God. Genuine uh, here is because, you know, there are false preachers and false teachers. You know, don't be ashamed of identifying with genuine ministers of God, even if they are suffering for the sake of uh, Christ. Uh, be willing to share in the sufferings of the gospel because God's power 
which is his, his dunamis power, his miracle working power, is what enables us to take, uh, uh, what enables us to do our part in the sufferings of the uh, gospel. Now, why is Paul telling him this? Is because, you know, many of them, many of them who are co-laborers with Paul, who are his co-workers, who are with him for so many years of his life, you know, have kind, kind of abandoned him, uh, uh, saying that they, they don't know Paul, they have nothing to do with Paul because they are afraid of their own lives because they know now Paul is uh, imprisoned and he is uh, going to, you know, Nero is going to, as persecuting many Christians, he's going to martyr uh, Paul. They too, because uh, they uh, are associates with Paul, co workers, co laborers with Paul, will also be identified, will also be imprisoned, and would also be killed or martyred. So many of them, you know. Uh, are uh, you know uh, not identifying with Paul, saying that they don't know him, and so Paul is writing to Timothy, "Don't be ashamed, you know, uh, uh, of testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ, and also don't be ashamed of uh, you know of uh, identifying with uh, ministers like me, uh, who are in prison, who are in chain, and are suffering because of." Uh, uh, you know, of sharing the gospel. And then he says, you know, also uh, share in the sufferings of the gospel. That means, you know, as a minister of God, you would have your share of um, being persecuted, of going to suffering because of the gospel that you're preaching. But he's uh, saying that, you know, um, you have God's power, his miracle working power, his dunamis power, which will enable you uh, and take you forward uh, uh, you know, even as you suffer for the uh, gospel. So Paul actually suffered, uh, he's saying, you know, Paul is saying here, um, um, you know, suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. So Paul is saying that actually he's suffering according to the power of God, which means he's saying that the power of God is always there, you know, uh, uh, is there even in times when they are preaching, teaching, uh, you know, stepping out to do signs, miracles and wonders, healing people, uh, the power of God is manifested, the power of God is activated in their lives, the power of God is there in their lives, available for them to use, but the power of God is also there uh, for them even when they are going through sufferings, when they are in prison, when they're in chains, when they're facing challenges because of their position as spiritual leaders or because of what they're doing as preaching the truth and teaching the uh, word of God. So, you know, remember that even as you are going through challenges in Christian ministry, difficulties, being persecuted, um, being ridiculed, being put down, put to shame, uh, gossip, made fun of. Uh, remember that the power of God is also activated at that time, is also man will be manifested in your life. The power of God will also strengthen you, uh, will enable you uh, to face uh, those challenges. Of course, the power of God will not remove the difficulties, will not remove the challenges, the persecutions, but the power of God will see you through those uh, difficulties. And it's so wonderful in the way that Paul puts it here. He says, you know, um, share with me the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Okay. So power of God is not just for signs, miracles, and wonders and preaching the gospel, but the power of God is also uh, uh, there, uh, made available for us even when we face difficulties and uh, challenges. So this is another very important dimension of God's miracle working power, that is his ability uh, to endure suffering, persecutions, hardships, oppositions for the uh, gospel. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Verses 1 to 8. Anything that you need clarity on? Not understood. Anything you want me to explain again? I'm just wondering what an amazing mentor Timothy had. I mean, what detailing Paul was into his, you know, guidance, the kind of uh, prayers and through words. So it's it's really enriching. Thank you. Thank you for teaching. Uh -huh. Yes. I know it's so wonderful. Thank you for sharing that thought. I mean, what a wonderful mentor. Yes. It also teaches us, you know, as we mentor people, 
you know, the extent that we need to go in just praying for them without ceasing, uh, teaching them, imparting into their lives, strengthening them, uh, you know, and also uh, reminding them of the powerful spiritual inheritance that we have, uh, just blessing God's people. Yes, wonderful. Now, Timothy was uh, privileged to have a mentor like, uh, uh, like Paul, um, you know, um, we can also ask God to help us to be the, that kind of mentors. Yes. Thank you, Sister Avani, for sharing that thought. It's just a wonderful insight. Thank you. Ma'am, I think uh, Paul had to build on the foundation that has been laid by uh, Timothy's grand grandparents, grandmother, and um, his mother, Lois and Eunice, respectively. And I, in that I glean, I, I recall that uh, it is important when we lay the foundation of faith from the home. We lay the foundation of faith from the home. So when they come to church, the pastors and our spiritual leaders would have to build on the foundation that has been laid by our parents or our, guide, our guidance, uh, guidance we leave in the home. They we leave them little work to do. Other than that, there's so much work to do on the individual who comes from a home that uh, ha has not been taken through the foundations of faith. So I believe the parents did extremely well by uh, introducing Timothy to the sincere faith that they had already lived in their lives. Yes, very true. Thank you for sharing that, Elisha. I just uh, agree with you. Uh, you know, it's so important for parents. So parents also, the role of spiritual nurturing is so important uh, uh, in the lives of the children that God has entrusted to you. You know, they are given to you uh, by God and it's important what you impart, you teach them from the very womb. Very true. You know, from the very womb, what you're teaching them, speaking into their lives, it's so important. And I see this in uh, one of the religions. I, I, I won't mention the religion because, you know, we are on YouTube and it's very uh, delicate issue when you talk about religion. But I admire this religion, you know, in uh, when the child is born, they don't even feed the child till the, you know, the priest comes and, uh, you know, speaks the, the, the uh, chants into the ears of the child. Uh, or recites things from their uh, their book into the ears of the child, and only then uh, can the mother feed the child. Even if the child is crying, they 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 don't feed the child. They wait, and you know, they they say that 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 scripture, that words of God, must just resonate in the ears of the child for the rest of their life. You know, keep going. They they keep listening to it. Uh, that's their foundation, and. Um, I've also seen this the same religion, you know, that that the, the parents are so uh, give so much of importance for their children to learn the uh, the language in which their uh, that that holy book is written. So even if the child doesn't do their homework, doesn't study the, their project work, no, it doesn't matter for them. What's important is the child has to go every day to their school where they learn their language, where they can read their holy book. And, you know, uh, it just does so important. And that's why we see this, people in this religion are so zealous for their faith. So when I see that, you know, that kind of, uh, uh, kind of makes me zealous for my faith and how I need to teach children, how I need to bring them up in the ways of the Lord. I think, uh, you know, uh, when we have the truth and we serve a true and living God, how much more zealous we need to be uh, to, you know, impart these truths. And and uh, what a good job, uh, you know, grand, uh, his uh, Timothy's grandmother, his mother and Paul have done. And uh, just seeing the amazing work that Paul uh, Timothy is doing uh, as a result in um, the church at Ephesus. Yeah, thank you, Elisha, for uh, uh, throwing light on that. Okay, we'll stop here at verse eight. Um, anyone else has any questions? Anything you'd like to share? Thank you for your uh, valuable insights and thoughts. This helps. Yes, Asha, you had your hand up. Sorry. Uh, we we'll have Asha speak and then Harrison. 
Pastor, I just want to clarify. Verse 7 and 8, where it talks about the power of uh, power and love and self-control, and was not to be ashamed of the testimony. So uh, is this uh, during, like, when believers are getting persecuted and when they're about to share the good news and how the world will treat them? I just want to clarify. I'm not sure. But... Okay. Can you just repeat the first half of your question, please? Because I didn't catch that. Um, from seven and eight words where it talks about, like, for God has given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord Jesus, and nor of his prisoner, but sharing suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So does it um, talk about, like, where the believers are getting persecuted, or um, it's like he's giving the uh, encouraging saying to be continue the same suffering. Okay, verse 7 is basically talking in the context of using the spiritual gifts. So he's saying don't be timid because uh, Timothy has spiritual gifts, but he's not being bold enough to use those, uh, those uh, spiritual gifts uh, uh, or flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. So he's saying, you know, don't be timid because you're not given a spirit of fear and he's reminding him of what he's been given. Uh, but in verse 8, he's talking about, um, you know, uh, in the view of the Spirit that God has given us, you know, don't be ashamed of speaking about the Lord. Don't be ashamed with identifying with other ministers who are suffering for the sake of the gospel. And also, uh, you know, uh, you know, even as you are suffering uh, uh, or going through suffering because of the gospel or what you're teaching or your position as a Christian leader, uh, you know, don't uh, uh, step away from that. Uh, be willing to participate in the sufferings of the gospel. Uh, why? Because God's power, which is the same power that is uh, able to do signs, miracles and wonders, is also the same power that will uh, strengthen you. Uh, in your difficult times and see you through the times of challenges and difficulties. Thank you, Pastor. Did that help, Asha? Yes, oh. Pastor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asha. Yes, Harrison, you have your hand up. All right. Um, I'm looking at the role um, Paul played in the life of um, Timothy and also the role Paul has played in the life of other leaders you know the gospel and i'm trying to liken it you know to our own time and one thing i'm feeling is that if we have you know the likes of paul played in our own time we will have you know a very good leadership you know in the christendom because it is very important that we have some leaders you know who are feeding you know, with the spirit of god leading the people so that people understand the real core responsibility of being a child of God or being a Christian. Because when you look at Timothy and the role Paul played in the life of Timothy, it's as a result of the sound leadership, you know, gotten from Paul. That is why we can testify of, test of Timothy today. So my own appeal to us is that as we are here, we can learn from Paul and we can also learn from Timothy, but most especially the role of Paul in the life of Timothy so that we can be sound Christians leading people in the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Yes, very true. So that we can, you know, pass on uh, the spiritual uh, legacy uh, to the generations. Yes, very true. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining class, for being patient these three hours, listening to my voice, <laughs> and for being part of the class. Uh, have a blessed day and a week ahead. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.